<clears throat> it's very big. We don't want to record this now, do we? Of 2020 online. Um, so there will be times for questions uh, later on. And if I could just ask you to ask the questions in the Q&A button. If you can see at the bottom, there's a Q&A button and we can go through them. Uh, alternatively, uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, there's a raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you want to ask a question verbally, um, please just push that button. We can see that you've raised your hand and then we'll unmute your microphone. Please mute your microphones in the meantime. Uh, we're also recording this event. Um, and uh, for those uh, that would like to see it again, for those that are not here, um, we'll make it available for everybody. So welcome to the end of year faculty forum. I would like to share my screen and probably need a bit of your help to tell me whether you can see what I'm sharing. Okay. Yep. okay, so at the end of year faculty meeting, what we usually do is we celebrate uh, the year that was and we talk about all the things that happened and also look forward to what the plans are for next year. So that's exactly what we'll be doing. We'll be talking, uh, I'll give you an insight or brief summary rather on uh, what's ha been happening uh, at ANU, at the college and at the school. We'll uh, talk about some staff news. Uh, we will have short reports from the associate and sub deans. Um, and then we will look towards the awards because one of the big celebrations at the end of the year is usually celebrate what we're good at and those people that are outstanding um, in what this school delivers. So first of all, celebrations, just to remember, it seems like forever ago, uh, but Chris Phillips and uh, Paul Smith um, were man made a member of the Order of Australia in January on Australia Day, and Walter Abayaratna um, got a medal um, of the Order of Australia. And we're very proud of our colleagues. Uh, big changes on ANU happened that there were <clears throat> from the government changes to higher education funding for the future with the aim to provide more university places and reduce costs to students. This will affect um, different disciplines in different ways, uh, but there is a thought that there will be reduced costs uh, for students in, in healthcare, so think nursing and allied health science and technology, whereas there will be increased costs to students in humanities, laws and commerce. We do not think that there'll be a change for students in medicine. You've also all voted um, for a variation in the EBA and delayed the pay increase that we were all entitled to by 12 months. And this is going ahead and has been approved by the Fair Work Commission. And I'll talk a little bit about the financial impact of the bushfires, the hailstorm, and of course, COVID-19. I think <clears throat> it is fair to say that uh, the, the bushfires and the hailstorm, particularly at the beginning of the year, were bad enough. Um, and then we were hit by this worldwide pandemic. And they have caused not just financial problems for the university and for us as a school, but also personal pain and personal suffering. From the school's perspective, I think it's particularly our colleagues in the Royal Clinical School that have really been battered this year because the bushfires had the biggest impact on them. And I would just like to thank them for their resilience and for the way they stood together and worked together as a team, not just to get themselves and the community and the students um, through the bushfires, but how they battled on then with us um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 then uh, resulted in the very quick development of procedures, risk protocols across ANU. Um, and I think it is fair to say that uh, what, what we were doing was probably always, fortunately or unfortunately, two or three weeks ahead of what ANU was doing. So we were trying to align in hindsight. But um, the, the safe return to campus for next year is well underway. The return of the International Student Pilot Project that was planned for the middle of the year has been delayed. Um, and I look forward to seeing that happen next year. As I said, uh, there are, has already been and there will be an ongoing gradual return to campus in 2021. The Vice Chancellor is very clear that he would like to see students back on campus if it is thought to be safe. This all had a huge effect on the budget of ANU. Um, and in summary, um, a lot of hundreds of millions of dollars need to be saved each year for the next three years. Um, and for our budget that I will talk 
about a little bit later. Um, we're still um, short a bit of money on what we're meant to be spending. The College of Health and Medicine, I think the big heading there is Transform, and I note that Russell Groen is online. Transform, if you haven't heard yet, is the strategy to achieve a vision for ANU as a top university. For us as a college, the vision is to be a top university for all Australians, to serve the nation and enhance the lives throughout the world. And the mission to achieve this is to secure health and advance well-being. And this really supports new initiatives in research, education and policy. And a lot of work has gone into this over the last year and a half and a white paper has gone to council in December 2020 and was accepted there as far as I'm aware, uh, which really supports the initiatives um, that the college is proposing, the vision for the college. And importantly, um, we are permitted to develop a budget case to see how we can move transform further into the next few years. In this, um, I'd just like to highlight that there are three headings. Uh, they're around a health systems institute, an educational and leadership powerhouse, um, and uh, support of research. And for us, as a medical school, it's particularly the education and leadership powerhouse that's important, um, because this is really around developing outstanding education, supporting the wonderful education we're already doing, but to shape the future of all health professional education, and to be world leading and renowned for training of health leaders of today and tomorrow. There's a lot on the Transform website and if you haven't looked at it, I encourage you to have a look and have a read of what we're going to do over the next 10 years. Medical school, once we uh, have gotten through the bushfire and again, thanking particularly Malcolm Moore, Christina Vett, um, Meg Milne and the whole team of the Royal Clinical School to lead the school um, through this time, um, the focus changed um, and we were focusing on COVID-19. And Imogen Mitchell, as the director of the school, really developed the Operation Graduate uh, Management Plan or Recovery Plan, where we set out what we needed to do and how we were going to do this for the next year to get us as a school through the pandemic and um, to uh, particularly outline for certain aims and the first aim that we had and the most important one was to graduate students this year and therefore we called this operation graduate management um, and uh, we delivered the business continuity plan and uh, facilitated ideas and communication for change and i think this was uh, a very smart plan imogen if you're online um, because we just followed those footsteps things changed a little bit but it really gave us um, ideas and a, a really structured way forward and I think it was very successful because we've delivered on every one of those items. In the school other changes um, as you're aware is the change of the uh, uh, director and deputy director and within education we have cha made changes to the phase two educational team structure. We have also under the guidance of Russell Crohn um, looked at what the medical school for the future could look, look like. Um, Imogen chaired the first task force uh, for the medical school for the future and really outlined um, the vision for the school and what would make the school distinctive. This task force, the task force two, um, looked at the strategies and the ideas that were behind it and then will look at a governance model and the model of the school. We have had uh, regular meetings with a small task force and a larger stakeholder group since August and really thought about what would make this school distinctive. This included a survey of all tasks, sorry, of all um, stakeholders that told us what they were looking for in the graduates of the future. They informed us on what we're doing really well and where we need to be strengthened. And out of this survey result and really thoughts about what makes us distinctive and leading in education, three proposals have come forward and they are firstly medicine plus the idea here is that the students already come into the medical school as postgrad students with certain skills passions um, or ideas and what we want them to do is to continue their learning in those areas so we may be able to combine medicine with other cross-disciplinary programs at ANU to give those graduates um, opportunities to be better equipped to be leaders of the future so if you think of a student who may have done uh, or is interested in uh, computer science <clears throat> or somebody who is interested in ethics, 
um, at the moment, what we do is we teach them medicine. And then once they graduate, we will ask them as doctors to continue their interest or their passion or their knowledge in those themes. So we want to support those students during the medical curriculum, which would mean that we need to free time during the cur curriculum to allow students to do that. And it might be that they will get a PhD or another master's degree or even a diploma out of this. The second proposal is medicine for life. And this is really the concept that medicine is lifelong learning. And what we would like to do as a university um, is to develop professional opportunities, sorry, develop opportunities for professional development for health professions, all health professions, um, to uh, support their ongoing learning throughout their careers. Now, clearly, this is something that we need to develop a bit more um, with the health organisations, not just locally, but maybe a bit further far, but particularly with the health professions as well, and look at the needs and see what we can do. Medicine in the world, the third proposal is really the concept that our curriculum um, already has, but we need to strengthen the distinctive flavor around medicine in the world, think indigenous health that we're doing already, um, but really to define what it is that they need to study that will equip them to learn about medicine, not just in Australia or in a developed world, but in developing worlds and others. These proposals uh, have uh, formed part of the, the white paper and the plan for next year is to develop this in a bit more detail. Now going on to staff news, um, we've had quite a few staff appointments in 2020 and here's the list of those that uh, have joined the medical school this year. Uh, it is a long list. Um, it is, uh, these are people who are either replacing other positions or positions that we have made, particularly with the professional staff review. And I'd just like to welcome these colleagues again to the medical school. We've also had new appointments in titles or academic faculty appointments. There are quite a few here. So these are colleagues that are working as clinicians here in the ACT and um, have sought an appointment with the medical school and have been successful in doing this. And these range from clinical associate professors to clinical associate lecturers. And they are a very important part of our school and of our mission. And I'd like to welcome those colleagues as well. And university and clinical promotions um, also were done during this year. Um, I think you may have seen the emails that I've sent out congratulating those colleagues that were successful in the university promotion. So these are the colleagues that uh, get a full title which will be effective from January on. Um, but we've also been very lucky that we've had wonderful staff apply for clinical promotion. And again, uh, clinical associate professors and clinical senior lecturers. And I'd like to congratulate these co colleagues on their promotion. Whilst we had lots of staff come to the school, we've also had retirements and departures. Starting um, in January with Annette Tunicliffe, who was the education support officer. Um, but throughout the year, there were some colleagues who just found other jobs. Others decided to retire uh, or uh, people who will uh, retire because of um, reasons that have to do with the um, ANU restructure. We're very sad to see these colleagues go. Uh, we wish them all the best for the future and we truly hope that they stay in contact with us to tell us how they're going. We are, however, still short a few academic appointments, chairs of psychiatry, medical imaging, obstetrics and gynaecology. Um, but I suspect that as we have done without these for quite a while, um, and restructure within the college and within the medical school of the future, that we might actually look at different ways of teaching what we're teaching. And it might not quite be these discipline specific chairs that we will be seeking in the future, but I will keep you updated on that. So uh, on the Canberra Health Service and ACT Health front, um, due to the COVID pandemic, the Clinical Health Emergency Coordination Centre or CHEC was formed. And they are really uh, in close contact with us around public health and Canberra Health Service directives in uh, alignment with, with the pandemic. Uh, we worked with them in terms of placements for the medical students, of course, screening, and we're using the uh, screening tool and app um, that is required to be used across all Canberra Health Service uh, services. 
at the medical school in conjunction with the Canberra Health Services, we have formed a clinical placement working group, but that was really the group that overlooked uh, the return of the clinical placements of the students. As you know, they were removed from placement for quite a while, uh, while we needed to work out how we could facilitate a safe return and particularly um, assure that the Canberra Health Services were aware of our uh, risk protocols, um, our training of the students, and that we were very clear on what the students were allowed to do and what they weren't allowed to do because it was thought to be unsafe. And this clinical placement um, working group has worked well. Um, and they overlooked this because there were a lot of changes that had to be made to the rotations. The ANU Canberra Health Service Task Force on Appointments or the Memorandum of Understanding uh, between ANU and Canberra Health Services uh, was put on hold during the pandemic um, and will probably be revamped next year. And we are receiving now updates from ACT Health, uh, the Chief Medical Officer and DDD regularly around what's happening in New South Wales and um, education. You've heard me talk about this before, but the way we look at budget um, has been different this year and will be different next year, rather than looking at the ins and outs, we're really just looking at our expenditure. So ANU is now um, having an expenditure control framework um, that, we'll, uh, that we're using, and this comes with accountability and regular reporting and is mon monitored by the colleges and um, ANU. We were required uh, since earlier in the year um, to accurately forecast all our funding, all our expenses, um, to see whether we could delay certain expenses, whether we could cut certain expenses. Um, this is uh, excluding the contractual legal and grant schemes um, where we had to meet our obligations. However, this uh, expenditure control um, framework alone is not um, able to financially sustain the university. So we also need an income strategy. And this could be around international students, but of course research grants and other ideas as well. Um, this is uh, looked at very closely at uh, the higher level at ANU, of course, um, but at the college, we're also looking at ways that we can make money given the cost reduction that we have suffered and that we will continue to suffer. For the budget in 2020, I think I can only express my congratulations to all of you because when Katrina Chapel and I came to you and said, what can you save? Where can we avoid expenditure? What can you delay to next year? All of you have come on board and we are under the number or the sum rather that we're allowed to expend for this year. However, our forecast for 2022 is not quite as good. Um, it looks at the moment as if we're over the allowed expenditure by about $800,000. But I know, because it happens every year, um, that during the year we can make some more savings. So we will continue to work with you. So what will 2021 bring? So you would have heard uh, the town hall um, just this week uh, that Russell Gruen gave, where he talked about the college change plan that will be presented to you and will be open for consultation sometime in February. We will also continue to work on the Medical School of the Future Task Force and outline these ideas that we have in more detail and particularly work out um, what is needed to do, to be done um, to make this reality. We will continue to uh, work on the Memorandum of Understanding with uh, Canberra Health Service and particularly around the appointments and of course plan the future for the college. So I might just stop there and see if anybody has any questions before I continue on. See the questions now, sure. Mm -hmm. Is there any hands 
I can't see any hands up. No hands up? Okay. Okay, I couldn't see any questions there, so I might just uh, continue on. Um, what I would like to talk about is um, Imogen Mitchell, who is our director and who, as you have been informed, um, leaving the director position at the end of the year, <clears throat> and uh, I will continue on in um, taking over her role. We had a bit of a celebration last week on um, for Imogen, but I'd just like to take this opportunity um, to all of you um, to talk a little bit about her and uh, to um, thank her for her contribution. So some of you are new to the school, so you might not quite know whom we were celebrating last week and whom we're saying goodbye to. Um, Imogen came onto the A News scene really in 2003 as a member of the Foundation Block Committee and the co chair of the Clinical Skills Committee. Um, and then she took on the role as the Associate Dean for Admissions, and that was followed by her role as the Associate Dean in Phase Two, uh, Deputy Dean, and finally the Dean and the Director of the school in 2016. Her achievements at the school are many. Um, and all of you would have run, read the weekly blog um, that told us of her activities during the week, um, uh, but also talked about her role and her challenges and achievements. And that really made uh, her work and where this school was going very transparent. During her time as a director, uh, Imogen made huge, made processes such as position descriptions, budgets, promotions, more transparent. She established a pre-med program, the Bachelor of Health Sciences, increased the school's visibility through so social media and marketing, established the research committee, and with it, the position of the Associate Dean Research, held initially by Jan Provis and now Chris Nolan. She made the school a national presence in dealing with harassment um, of students, built the TELT team as a point of differentiation to other schools, uh, led us through the AMC accreditation, gave the school more visibility through her membership on national committees, led the implementation of the Bill Nichols Scholarship um, for Medicine, initiated the stethoscope ceremony for the year one students, and last not least, undertook multiple reviews of the school on budget, professional staffing, costing, and a school review that was um, led by international reviewers. And as I said last week, Imogen, your contributions um, have moved the school forward in a, in a huge way. Um, and this is thanks to your vision, uh, your passion and your leadership. And you've inspired most of us um, to aim higher, to dream bigger and to reach for the stars. Um, but you've also touched many people. And whether this was through your compassion, encouragement, inspiration, transparency, collaboration, kindness, practical help, creativeness, humanity, ideas, initiatives, thoughtfulness or strategy. We always felt that you had our back and uh, were always aiming to move us forward. And that could have been just via a gentle prod or a strong kick up the back backside. Um, but you did this to us as individuals, as well as groups, personally or professionally. And when we were on a high, but also when we needed just a bit of encouragement. Um, I uh, would like to say thank you, thank you for um, your contribution to the school, but personally, your support of me, um, your inspiration, your uh, way of kicking me up the backside to just try a little bit harder. Um, and what I particularly liked um, was that we shared the same dreams and the same ideas and um, also the same values. Now, dreaming big or the impossible is what you do. 
um, and things may have seen a bit hard at times, um, but you've always um, tried to reach your goal. And I know that you will continue to do so. Um, we will uh, have you uh, ongoing uh, as a senior uh, academic here with us uh, in the medical school. So I will continue to pick your brain and I will continue to ask you for advice and I will continue to ask you uh, what you think of our strategy in our vision. And um, I'm very reassured by that. Um, so we're delighted that you continue here with us at the school um, and we look forward, maybe not quite the blog, although I would love your help with um, writing for us, but maybe we can read other blogs from you and we'd like to hear from you um, in the future. And I know that we will. So on that note, I would just like to ask Imogen if she could um, to maybe say a few words to, to the faculty. Uh, thanks, Jorka. Hoping that you can hear me. Um, so thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, an evening when we actually we celebrate success and reflect on the year's activities. And as you've all heard, uh, what a year to reflect upon too. What with the bush, bushfires dominating January, and I remember you know looking at the fire app to determine whether it's safe for students to go uh, rurally and then realizing actually I wasn't an expert in uh, determining whether bushfires were safe or not. Uh, then we were of course overridden by the hugely destructive hailstorm and then superseded by the potentially terrifying global COVID-19 pandemic. And all of this with working through Transform and what that might mean for the medical school. So it's been quite a year. But if we think about it through the great leadership of Zizorka, uh, we've done amazingly well. Our year four students have managed to graduate against all odds. Our teaching and learning has predominantly moved to online and we've seen some great people promoted and gained Category 1 grants. All a huge achievement, even without a pandemic. Uh, and so everyone really should be congratulated uh, on what has been achieved through this really quite challenging time. But as the year comes to a close, so does my time as head of the medical school. It really has been the most extraordinary role and certainly my best job so far. It has been made extraordinary first and foremost by the people I've had the privilege of working with. I truly have never worked with such a dedicated group of people. Uh, as I say many, many times, working far in excess of the hours that uh, people are paid. And with that genuinely palpable uh, sort of feeling that everyone was working to the benefit of the student. I guess the second reason for its extraordinariness uh, is the variety of the position. Uh, you can be sitting in national meetings discussing national problems and then the very next hour listening to a distressed student and hopefully helping them along their way. To then exploring the most beautiful parts of the world, and that to me is probably the South, New South Wales coast. And all of course with the excuse that you're seeing the Rural Clinical School. I sincerely do not know of such an extraordinarily varied job. And finally, the sense of helping shape the lives of future doctors is such a rewarding experience and certainly will never be forgotten. And so while this year for me and many others has been challenging, I leave the role grateful that I was given the opportunity, deeply privileged to have worked with such extraordinary people and that I was able to learn so much about higher education of which I knew very little before. I have no doubt that the medical school will go from strength to strength and remain so thankful for leaving the school in such great hands and in particular Zizorka and of course her trusty helper, Cheryl. I do hope over the next couple of months that you'll manage to get some rest. But again, I want to thank uh, particularly Zizorka tonight uh, for taking on the school at such short notice, which I know was incredibly challenging, but has done such a great job. So my deep thanks. Thanks, Zizorka. Thank you, Imogen. And I bet if we were in the auditorium now, a standing ovation for you. So just imagine dream, dream your dream your standing ovation. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to then turn um, to our reports. So this is going to be a bit tricky because I have to drive the slides for <laughs> the sub-deans and associate deans to um, give their reports. First person to report would be Karen Messerly. Karen, can you hear us? And can you speak? 
Can you hear me? We can hear you. Good. Um, so I'll talk to you about phase one. Um, so we've had only minor staff changes this year. Next year we'll be having Dr. Lex Maxim van Loon helping us with our physi neurophysiology teaching and Suzanne Estefan, who's already here and been here for some time, will also be helping with our neurophysiology as Corinne Carl left earlier this year. We also welcome um, Sutasa, uh, Dr. Neiman Sutasa, who um, will be helping in population health. Um, this year, 2020, we had some curriculum changes in year two. Um, we, this was the very first run of our new transition block in block seven. Um, because of the year that it was, uh, we actually used the time for which we were very grateful largely to catch up um, the physical examination skills for our year two students. But we were, over that period of time, able to trial run some of our new transition block elements successfully and look forward to completing that job next year. Um, as a result of the curriculum changes, our end of year exams were held earlier at the end of block six and all of these changes went very smoothly. So, um, and uh, our students have done very well in year two. Um, teaching and assessment in semester two this year continued online thanks to the wonderful work of our phase one teaching staff and support staff, um, it all went very well. Um, and we, I feel very confident that our students in year two are ready for year three and that our students in year one are ready for year two next year. Um, and uh, in particular, I'd like to mention the clinical skills team um, who made the impossible possible this year um, catching up on all the physical examination skills that the students have um, had originally missed out on. They made really the impossible possible and nothing was too difficult for them. So under the leader, le wonderful leadership of Janelle Hamilton, Michelle Barrett, Alastair Walters and Lyndall Thorne, um, most of our students have successfully completed um, their uh, catch up physical examination skills. Um, we've been we will continue next year to be teaching in a hybrid model um, with some of uh, much of our teaching online. However, we're um, planning to introduce more face-to-face -face teaching, uh, including clinical skills, medical science practicals, and some of our small group teaching insofar as we can. Phase one, um, in 2021, we hope to be working um, hard on our uh, project for block one, uh, we're, we're changing our fan foundation block um, and we hope to update you on that more next year. And we hope next year to complete our full uh, transition block, block seven, for the first time. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Shijoka. Thank you, Karen. Congratulations. Great job. Any questions for Karen? Remember to use the Q&A button if you want to. Or raise your hand. No raised hand, no Q&A. That's crystal clear. Thank you, Karen. I'd like to now invite Nick Taylor to talk about <coughs> phase two. Nick, can you hear, hear? And are you unmuted? I hope. Yeah. Can everyone hear me? I can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. This, these are your slides now. Well, I was just going to submit this as um, the summary of phase two, um, but I think given all of the challenges we've had, I think we can pre present a slightly more positive version. So um, essentially phase two, um, Jacques, I'm just going to have to trust you to click. Yeah. Summary is really through challenge comes innovation and adaptation, otherwise known as what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, of course, this year was going to be the year where clinical synthesis and increased contact with supervisors um, was going to be the mainstay of how we pivoted, but unfortunately, coronavirus came along. We came up with plans A, B, and C very rapidly, and really amazingly, within two weeks, we'd managed to put almost all of our teaching online. Uh, scribing modules were developed by students and then rolled out to students, and we put a whole lot of clinical teaching online, created an entire website, um, within a couple of weeks to support this. 
all of the blocks had to be reformatted and we introduced the catch up block um, at the end of the year, which was actually very successfully run um, with lots of positive feedback from students about the catch up block. Um, when students were returned to a COVID safe placement experience, um, the process went really well. There was lots of really strong advocacy from the medical school to health to achieve this but we felt like our students actually um, had a, a reasonable clinical experience. And really this all culminated at the end with examinations, which for the first time for the medical school entirely moved online. And we really, you know, I'm really grateful for the, particularly the year four exam committee. A lot of schools um, didn't actually run a clinical examination this year. Um, our committee was very keen to make sure that we did have our students um, tested clinically. And so a, a novel exam format was created, the SCBD, um, based on a format from the University of Melbourne. Um, and, you know, in a very short amount of time, this new novel format was, was prepared and tested and run. And, and the results at the end of that were, were, six, were very successful. The whole of year four has passed. So really from this year what we've learned is that we, we can be agile we can adapt rapidly a lot of the goals we had for the curriculum for the future um, we've had to accelerate um, one of the things we did manage to get this done this year was a, initial mapping um, and reformatting of our current curriculum um, that was done by what a project officer emma hall who's done a fabulous job of putting the curriculum into a searchable um, and logical format. In doing that, what she's done is mapped it to outcomes such as the AMC outcomes. And for the first time we can see um, our whole phase two curriculum um, and, and, and where, how it relates to our themes and frameworks, but also where the gaps and overlaps are. Um, I'm hopeful I'll be able to share this website where this is based with all of you so you can um, have become much more, more familiar with this curriculum, but also um, help us to begin to, to replan how a new one would look. We're going to continue our online um, format for most of our teaching with a bit of a hybrid model um, in 2021. Clinical Skills has done a fantastic job this year of adapting as well. They managed to um, almost essentially cover the whole of the Clinical Skills program, despite students being off campus for an extended period. And they've also managed to introduce a couple of novel um, items such as um, SIMS, which are incredibly popular with students and supervisors and formative assessments. For next year, we've actually taken some of the um, lessons we've learned in terms of our calendar. Obviously, we made massive changes rapidly to the phase two calendar. Um, for next year, we're going to have year three, um, just factor in a, a little bit of um, flex just in case um, COVID rears its head again, we need some space. And for year four, we've realized that we can achieve our curriculum goals in the blocks that are a bit shorter, which instead of a catch up block, we're planning a mandatory print term. And we've just finished our phase two meeting where we're talking through um, what would the curriculum and the assessment of the print term be. But we're expecting that um, all students will have to complete a workplace based intern readiness print term for six weeks um, prior to sitting exams. I think this is really exciting. It has been a gap for phase two, particularly when we compare to other medical schools and our AMC assessment in the past. So I think the print term is an incredibly exciting opportunity um, to bring in some novel forms of assessment, to write a curriculum that's um, outcome focused and work readiness focused and to give our interns um, the best leg up they can get prior to commencing as new doctors. I'd personally like to thank all of the phase two committee for how flexible and supportive they've been. And particularly Julia Legg, who without her, there is no way um, I would personally be able to function or phase two. And also to Zizorka, who's incredibly um, supportive leadership throughout the COVID experience allowed us to be able to rapidly make um, decisions and be adaptive um, in a time frames that were ridiculous at times, but I always felt incredibly supported by Zsorka, so thank you. 
Thank you, Nick. Any questions for Nick? So raise your hand, please. No, nope. Nick, you've made it all crystal clear. Thank you so much. Um, Amanda Barnard. Amanda, you next talk about the Royal Clinical School. Can you hear us? And can you say something so we can see if we can hear you? Yep, I can, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Stage is yours, Amanda. Amanda? Amanda, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, sorry, I, I pressed the unmute, but it was a bit odd. Um, so, look, I'd just like to echo Nick's thoughts. Thanks to you, Zizhork, for the support uh, that you and the rest of the school gave me when I came back halfway through the year. And I noticed that you noted particularly the work of um, Malcolm and Meg and CV in dealing with the, uh, the aftermath of the bushfires in our communities in the Yurubadala and Bega. And so in some ways I came back when uh, the hard work was done. Um, we had COVID, but, but the plans had been resettled. Um, I think we're very lucky rurally in terms of the fact that we have small numbers for our um, long-term rural students. And although we have a, a number of short terms out at the, at the one time, they are fairly diverse. So, we were able to return to clinical placements and face-to-face -face teaching quite early in a COVID-safe manner. Um, we needed to, and the team very rapidly um, provided PPE and masks for students when that became mandatory in New South Wales health facilities and highly recommended in our GP practices. One of the things we kept up um, was our staff meetings, obviously, and they became much more frequent. But I think, in a sense, we're a little bit lucky because we have been used to online teaching for the short-term rural students and online meetings anyway. Um, so for us, it was a lot more of the same and obviously a lot of changes. Um, I've characterised it as flexibility, adapt, adaptability and resilience um, from both the rural and the Acton staff, particularly noting how a number of our rural staff were personally affected, particularly by the bushfires, and obviously many in their communities, friends, relatives, patients, were also um, severely affected in many cases. Um, but people just kept on going and thinking about our students and their welfare. We had some secondments to, the, uh, to help with the COVID response. Sally Hall um, joined Professor Michael Kidd's team in the Department of Health in Canberra. And Meg Milne has spent the last three months with the uh, Department of Human Services in Victoria. I mean, she's been based here helping work on their healthcare um, preparedness and PPE response. Um, on a very bright note though, and those of you who can see that picture very, uh, which is of the new clinical teaching facilities in Bega, looking out over beautiful lush dairy fields. Um, the facilities which are part, which were part of a joint uh, funding that we actually received in 2001 with the universe 2011 sorry with the uh, University of Canberra actually came to fruition and were opened on the 13th of November uh, and that's very exciting for our students um, we have significant funding from that same funding round, but this one's just for ANU, for refurbishment of um, at Goulburn for a substantial teaching unit there um, in the old hospital. Those may be well aware that there's a new hospital being built in Goulburn. This has 
greatly um, enhanced our increased capacity for teaching and that's gone hand in hand with as the hospitals have been redeveloped um, southern local health district has been successful in employing a number of, of more of both staff specialists and vmos in both bega and goulburn and one of the things we did just discuss at the phase two meeting was the possibility well, we will do it and working out how of sending um, more students on uh, from years three and four on rural placements. Um, you may already be aware that everybody in third year, well, about 25% of the cohort spends their entire year rurally and everybody else spends six weeks in rural general practice. Uh, and in fourth year, a number of students can do rural selectives in acute care, women's health and psychiatry. But we're now looking at appropriate um, exposures to general medicine and general surgery in BEGA initially. Um, and now we have had that capacity and we have staff down there who are very keen to teach uh, and, and feel they have the capacity to. So I think that's, that's something that's um, very exciting. Uh, year one was very different because we didn't have a rural week one and we, I must admit I was very anxious about how we would get enough applicants for the rural stream for 2021 because we interview them the students at the end of year one and then they have we offer them additional rural uh, opportunities in year two before they go rurally for all of year three but we actually ended up with 38 applicants uh, and in fact have decided to offer a couple of additional places for 2022. Uh, the Indigenous health team have continued and been very involved with the bushfire research and other research down on the south coast in Mogo. The Indigenous health stream obviously continued but were unable to have the sort of face-to-face -face meetings and um, that, that they were used to, but uh, the team has continued to be in contact with them. Uh, we're also negotiating at the moment and hoping that um, we will be able to send year three students in their rural general practice term to some Western New South Wales placements. Um, obviously this year we weren't able to send anybody up to the Northern Territory and um, that may still be a, a little bit difficult next year, although we do have some, some placements organised, but the, the opportunity to work with partners in Western New South Wales, I think is very exciting. Another part of the, the rural clinical school that's funded under the Rural Health Multidisciplinary Training Program is um, the Training Hub. And that's been successful with a large amount of student support and career planning for, the, for year threes and fours, and a very significant workforce mapping project, which is being carried out in Southeast New South Wales um, with the cooperation of the LHD. And I think that will prove a very useful tool both for us but, and, and, and for our partners in the, in the LHD. So all in all, I think um, it's been, like everybody else, a challenging year. Um, our feedback from the students has been that, in fact, they feel that they have been very much supported um, throughout this year and have been very grateful for the opportunities to return to clinical placements and particularly return to face-to-face -to -face teaching. Um, so I'd just like to thank all the team, as I said, who did most of the hard work before I arrived, but for their ongoing um, enthusiasm in both stepping up to new roles as people have taken secondments, but in working very hard to um, maintain those link with, links with all our rural uh, academics and professional staff. Um, so we are planning for a, a 2021, which looks much more like a normal year with the COVID safe plans for um, Rural Week 1. And we hope that, um, like everybody else, that the year goes smoothly and the students can uh, get the most out of their experiences. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Amanda.
Uh, I can see now in the Q&A, there's a hand up, Diana Perryman. Diana, off you go. Um, uh, uh, that was, sorry, uh, uh, that was left from last time. And all I was going to say is just, I was just going to reiterate how um, incredibly supportive the students feel, have felt and how amazing this school has been. So I just wanted to, after Nick's, I was going to say that, but it's appropriate for after Amanda's as well. Sorry. Oh, oh thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Sorry, I must have overlooked your hands up there. Any other questions for Amanda then? No? Great. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you so much for coming back and helping us. My pleasure. Okay. So uh, the next uh, feedback or Summary really is around medical education and admissions from uh, David Kramer. Uh, David is on very, 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 very well-deserved leave, so he can't be with us, but he sent this rather funky slide to me. So as you know, David uh, looks after admissions and assessment. This year, in terms of admissions, the GAMSAT was set online. What we did was uh, doing online interviews, which were then recorded um, they were Zoom-based and uh, could then be reviewed and assessed and scored, and that allowed us to make um, offers. And whilst he just summarised all this on three dot points, this was a huge effort, and congratulations to the um, admissions team for organising this. Um, as somebody who, who was involved in these interviews, for, for me, it just seemed so easy. You just click on your link and you're in a room, and then automatically you get transported into another room, and the right student turned up at the right time on your screen. Um, and I can imagine that that was very hard to do. So again, congratulations. So what that allowed us to do is, uh, uh, here is a summary of the, the students for 2021. So there will be about 25 students commencing um, who are from the Bachelor of Health Science. So I've come through the pre-med program, the program that Imagine set up, and that's the first cohort of students that will come in. So this program is truly coming to fruition now. Uh, 80 students uh, will commence uh, through the JAMSAS program and we've offered um, three to five uh, students from, from overseas um, a place. Most of them are already in country, some are out of country. Um, and for all the international students, including those from, from the AMU, we've decided that they needed to let us know whether they have a visa or an exemption to travel into the country um, by mid-December, which is uh, the cutoff to get their, their deposit back and we're waiting to hear from them. Now the same online um, uh, effort that has gone through teaching and learning and through the admissions was then continued through assessment. So phase one um, had an open book online exam. And whilst you may all think that it's very easy, open book, students can just look everything up. Um, there's obviously a time limit to that. Um, this went very well and the outcomes of those students um, are no different from, from previous years, I understand. Uh, so it's not about cheating, but it's about <clears throat> students just being um, able to look the odd thing up or not. The phase uh, one students also had to have a clinical skills sign off. Phase two students um, had written MCQs, which were invigilated through proctorio, um, and they had many cases. This was all done on Wattle. And as Nick said uh, previously, they also had um, a, a clinical assessment um, that was done online. So we did some OSCEs and some case-based discussions. And again, here, my congratulations to the assessment team, particularly Claire and Clara, who've, who've made this happen. I think I heard the number of 1,600 OSCEs or something run over that, that time period. So that is a huge effort and it seemed to have worked without too many glitches. So congratulations and thank you so much for, for, for your help. Um, David would like to thank the educators who adapted to the teaching um, because uh, it was difficult to uh, reach out to them. And I think everybody was very open and very... Um, understanding uh, of, of the changes we had to make, but also um, very good in giving us feedback. He wants to thank the professional staff who made this happen, and of course the volunteers who assessed the students in 2021, 
and he thinks that it was a great team med school success story. So if you have any questions around admissions and assessment, please ask them now and I shall try to answer them. If they're too difficult, I'd defer to my colleagues. No questions, well, that's very lucky. So I might then just hand over to, um, as the last uh, person to give you an update on what's happening, um, Chris Nolan, to talk about research. Chris. Thanks, Shushoka. Um, for research, it's been a, a pretty challenging year uh, with uh, bushfires, there were closed downs of uh, John Curtin for a little while, and COVID has uh, really affected many researchers um, within uh, clinical trials, there was a slowdown with laboratory-based uh, research, labs closed. Um, but the research uh, academics uh, of the med school were incredibly resilient. And the other is they adapted and actually got involved in COVID and bushfire research and contributed an enormous amount in those spaces. So, uh, as far as the research committee, uh, the membership of the committee was renewed this year and all members of the committee now represent a particular group, whether that's uh, clinical research or social science type research, etc. Um, the, the membership uh, has changed and, and people represent particular groups. And we have uh, two early career researchers uh, Lillian Smarthen and, and uh, Amita Banzel that have joined um, and it's really refreshed the group. Um, also within the research committee we've, uh, um, because the research committee doesn't meet as often uh, and from meeting to meeting to try and get things to happen, um, previously it was very slow, now we have an operational group and uh, within that group is Ricardo Natoli, Anna Olsen, Christian Lewick and Diana Perryman. Um, and I think we've achieved a lot more through, through that group, keeping things moving and thanks to them. So the activities of this year, one of the important activities was to, to try and determine what we actually do and do well uh, and increase our visibility. And with that, uh, we uh, had the first ever Annam's research report put together um, and, and that's online for people to look at. Thanks to everyone who contributed to that. It's not entirely comprehensive and it was not meant to be, but was to show some of our areas that we're excelling in. Other work we've done, so within uh, uh, the transform process and uh, developing a research strategy for the college, it's important for us to know what we can contribute. And so with, within ANIMS, uh, we've come up with research themes and also an ANIMS research mission statement. And so the themes are two broad themes. One is the future of society and health, and the other is decoding health and disease. I guess the second one is more biomedically focused and perhaps translational uh, research of, of basic findings to clinical care. And future in society and health, um, more about um, uh, the, the social determinants of health, um, health service delivery, etc. Um, so with the mission statement, um, we're all about advancing health through knowledge, mobilising great science, attract, strengthen and thrive. So we need to, to attract good young researchers. We need to train uh, excellent researchers and, uh, and that's how our research will thrive. And engagement and ad advocacy. So to take our, our, the, the people that use health uh, and our health services, bring them along with us and for them to help us achieve our research, research goals. Plans for 2021, um, we need to align the medical school research with the transform research strategy and uh, into the new year, there'll be a lot more work with that. Uh, improving uh, the ANIMS research webpage. So we ha we've increased our visibility, hopefully through the research report, which is on the website, 
but we want to um, uh, revamp the, the website and uh, so it's easier to see what we do and how to contact people, how to uh, make collaborations, etc. And we want to establish a, a peer review strategy along with the college uh, peer review strategy to increase our, our success in grants, etc. Um, so that will be work of 21. Um, as well as thanking the whole of the research committee and researchers, um, some special thanks to Fiona Quinlan, who is uh, providing admin support. She started this year for research and hopefully you're getting to know her. Bob Karopi um, helped uh, with communications and again increasing our visibility, ran quite a few stories, helped with the research report. Remke um, Argio Bruce uh, uh, really did all the graphic designing for the research uh, report, which is a lot of work um, unpaid, and thank you for that. And Diana Perryman, so this year with COVID, bushfires, etc., it's been a challenging year for HDR, and, and Diana really stepped up and uh, she created opportunities to get the, the cohort together, supported uh, people that were struggling at various times for various reasons. She uh, has done a fantastic job this year. And thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, Nick, questions for Chris. Hands up. Chat no. Clear and succinct. Thank you very much, Chris. Okay, which now brings us to the really fun part uh, of this evening, uh, which is around the um, giving of the awards for excellence in medical education. Now, I must admit, I find this incredibly awkward. I'd rather have you all sit here and cheer and clap. Um, to have to do this on Zoom is, is um, very different. So, um, as you may know, the um, Excellence in Teaching Awards are awards that are given to us as faculty or teachers, um, whether we're faculty or not, um, mainly by the students, um, and they get given out in different categories. We then, uh, for this year again, had the students help us sort through the nominations and um, encourage the students to nominate, and there have been lots and lots of nominations um, for us, which I think is a reflection not just of, of the quality of teaching but also of the appreciation by the students of the teaching and that's why I think these awards are very special. So let's start with the first category. These are awards for teaching in phase one and the nominees uh, for this year were Raphael Wong, Paul Pavley, Christine Phillips, Alexandra Curry and Mitali Fadia. And based on the submissions and the reviews, the winner for the award of the Teaching Excellence in Phase 1 this year is Professor Paul Pavley. So the nominations read, and I'm not reading out all of them, but what the students said was that Professor Pavley's lectures were some of the best lectures we received in Phase 1. Uh, it really comes through that he values and enjoys teaching. The quality of his teaching as well as the resources he provides are excellent. It's clear that he's put a lot of thought of effort into making the content accessible, relevant, and easy to understand. Um, Professor Pavley made me love gastro. And if that doesn't deserve an award, then I don't know what does. Congratulations, Paul. Now, all of the winners will receive a certificate, um, uh, which we'll get to you, but at the moment, you'll just have to make do with everybody clapping virtually. The next category is the uh, category for the award for teaching excellence in phase two. And the awardees, sorry, the nominees here were Guatam Banot, Carly Johnson, Chris Christian Kundi, Nicholas Malouf, and Dipti Telalika. And the winner here is Guatam Banot. And again, congratulations. Whilst you're all clapping, I'm just reading out some of the nominations. Iskaltum is a very patient, kind teacher. He teaches us not just the science of medicine, but he's also truly a master of the art of medicine. How to break bad news, how to de-escalate a difficult situation, and also how to increase patients' health literacy. Despite his busy life of studying, studying for the basic physician exam, he always has time for students. 
He never belittles us or is condescending and answers all students' questions thoughtfully. Congratulations on your award. And again, you will also receive a certificate. The nominees for the award for teaching excellence in cl clinical supervision are Frank Pichoneri, David Brown, Pam Whalen, Bonnie Reeves, Nithin Colano, Matt Schwoss, Raphael Wong, and Michael Santamo. And the winner, or rather the winners in this category, there were two, are David Brown and Bonnie Reeves. Congratulations to the two of you. For David, the student said that he encouraged students' involvement in consults, even to the extent of allowing the students to run the majority of the consults by the end of the rotation. Always happy to answer questions and teach in between consults, even if he was running behind with patients. Bonnie showed a structured, educational and supportive approach to supervision and teaching. She gave us opportunities with patients to develop clinical skills and reasoning in a safe atmosphere and provided feedback in a constructive and non-critical way. We always felt a valued member of the team and felt supported. Congratulations to those two winners. For the award for teaching excellence in a rural setting, we have one uh, nominee, and uh, that is uh, Jenny Huang. And uh, Jenny is the winner, of course, of this. And uh, just reading out some uh, of the students' nominations is Jenny always involved us during her consultations, and we learned a lot from parallel consulting and uh, using telephone consulting. Her Thursday mornings, uh, emergency department simulations were extremely educational. Congratulations, Jenny. These are the um, nominees for the Award for Excellence in Tutoring. Um, Pam Whalen, Ananthan, with a very long complicated name, sorry, Wendy Chesworth, Melanie Johnson Saliba, Sutasa Naoman, Sue Morris, Peter Scott, Kai Hodgkin, Robert Look, and Linda Bates. And the winner for excellence in tutoring is Wendy Chesworth. Congratulations, Wendy. And the nomination said that in the face of the challenging task that is leading PBL over Zoom, Wendy has proven that online learning can be just as good as face-to-face -face sessions. As a year one PBL facilitator, Wendy went out of her way to act as the patient each week. She wore costumes, used a variety of Zoom virtual backgrounds, and adopted symptoms such as shortness of breath for the entirety of history taking process. She even created sputum samples from cooking ingredients that matched the case history. On behalf of our PBL group, Wendy was instrumental in our meeting and exceeding the learning objectives in each case. That sounds very entertaining and very <laughs> funny. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Congratulations. Um, these are the teams uh, that were nominated by the students um, for, as, for citation for outstanding contribution to student learning. Uh, the nominees were the pediatrics team, Alcon Drug Service Team, Ashish Vaska, Annabelle Celery, Sarah Zanetti, Jerry Corrigan, and Carolyn Luke. And uh, the citations, winners of the citations uh, go to Sarah Zanetti and Ashish Vaska this year. Um, for Sarah, uh, it was said that she goes above and beyond in her professional role as a junior medical officer in teaching and mentoring. While her job keeps her incredibly busy, she still finds time to teach not only key intern skills and how to do them well in order to help her patients, but also any academic concepts that have arisen. She teaches beyond the academic curriculum. I've learned so much about the importance of good communication, the value of teamwork and treating others with consideration and kindness. And Ashish uh, was thought uh, that he kindly let students accompany him when he was admitting patients onto surgical wards. He got the students to take history, do clinical exams, asked them to interpret scans and images, and um, particularly practiced ISBA with them. Um, congratulations to both of you as the winners of this award. And for the Award for Excellence in Innovation, there were two nominees, Carolyn Luke and the Clinical Skills Team. And this year's winner is Carolyn Luke. Congratulations, Carolyn. 
Carolyn has designed a series of scenarios uh, to develop clinical reasoning skills in phase one students currently aimed at year two. The scenarios are paper based, but could be used either face to face or online tutorials, which was very handy this year. And they've become a virtual resource for online teaching. Year two students now have a structured, entertaining and active method of learning clinical reasoning before they transition into the important phase two. And the feedback from students and tutors have been universally extremely positive. So congratulations, Carolyn, well done. And it really shows that um, even in a, in a pandemic and under lots of stress, one can um, be very innovative. And the winner of this year's Teacher of the Year Award is Raphael Wong. Raphael is a valuable addition to the clinical skills teaching team. It's evident that he spends time before classroom to prepare for the weekly clinical skills session. Appreciate that he tried to provide opportunities for each student to raise questions, concerns, took time to address each question um, with aid for their clinical reasoning. Uh, he also has the gift of simplifying difficult concepts. So there were quite a few um, of such uh, submissions from the students about Raphael and he's a very well, uh, he, he deserves this award. Congratulations, Raphael. Now there are also um, some awards that are given away by the director uh, and really are an acknowledgement of the director uh, to often professional staff um, or professional staff teams or other teams about their contribution to um, teaching and learning or what the medical school does in terms of research support. And I must say, I, I didn't know this year whom to award this um, award because there isn't one team or one person that stood so much above the others that they deserve um, to be acknowledged above all others. So this year, uh, probably for the first time, um, I'm announcing that there will be multiple awards given away. And the awards that I've chosen to give away belong to these teams. The admissions team, and I've already talked about the a team making the um, interviews online available, very easy for those who interviewed, I assume very easy also for those who were interviewed um, and have just been um, outstanding in making such a difficult process seem so easy. The team that uh, is responsible for teaching and learning and the Bachelor of Health Science also, just like the MCHD, had to go online within a few days and deserves um, recognition for their efforts. The phase one team, um, you've already heard Karen Messerly talk about the huge effort um, and the changes um, that they had to make. Uh, the lab team that just as if it was nothing um, not only transferred the lab uh, assessment and the labs themselves onto um, uh, Zoom, but behind the scenes continued um, to uh, facilitate a, a return and good, good learning for the students. The teaching and learning phase two team um, have been as wonderful as the others. And uh, I must say, particularly when it came to clinical placement, it seemed as if I was telling them every six hours to change something because students were either coming back to placement or not and things were going online and they couldn't do this kind of placement or that kind of placement. And they've been incredibly um, patient, um, but they have also been very innovative and very communicative to the student. The clinical skills team, oh my God, who could have ever thought that you can learn clinical st skills online to a certain extent before students were allowed back. And I think again, innovation, resilience and teamwork came through with the clinical skills team. The placement team, so these were the, the teams that I'd already talked about that uh, changed um, placements for students very frequently, um, given the, the need of the hospitals or the health services, but also the needs of the students. The assessment team, online assessment, who would have thought that that is possible with so few glitches and done in such a short time. And again, with many, many changes, um, very frequently. The TELT team, so this is the team that uh, Imogen in her wisdom as a Dean and Director had invested heavily in and it's to really come to fruition um, that technology enhanced learning um, saved us this year and really made the learning for the students good and we 
are creating safe and good future doctors. The Royal School team really talked about, really battered this year through um, the, the bushfires, but also um, COVID uh, were very adaptive and they were um, so wonderful in really showing us how you can uh, place students um, in, in their rural placements whereas the, the, the big hospitals were lagging behind a bit and their support of the students, as I've learned when, the, when I attended their, their meeting just uh, last week or so, um, has been outstanding because the students were quite distressed about being isolated from their family and friends. And of course, there's the operations team. And this is around management, IT, workplace health safety, communications, marketing, uh, research administration, research projects, um, receptionists, project officers, and of course, Cheryl is uh, the executive assistant, um, have been the, the, the backbone um, of this team. So congratulations to all of you and my sincere appreciation and thanks to all your efforts. And I think that award um, is well deserved. And we're nearly finished getting to the um, Director's Excellence in Teaching Awards. Now, this is an award that uh, Imogen uh, thought we should have, um, and it took us a little while to develop this, but it was for the first time given out last year. And this is really an award that recognizes faculty members who've demonstrated sustained teaching excellence and achievements um, at the medical school. The award functions through peer nomination and then looking at the eligibility, um, the nominees are asked to um, apply for the prize. The peer nomination has to be supported by somebody else. And then the panel um, will uh, review the application and the evidence and makes a recommendation um, to the director of the awardee. And this year we had uh, five nominees and you will recognize them all as great teachers in this school. Um, they were Ricardo Natoli, Sheila O'Neill, Carly Johnson, Jason Agostino and Sarah Martin. And I'm absolutely delighted to announce tonight that the winner of the 2020 Director's Excellence in Teaching Award goes to Carly Johnson. So Carly, as you know, is a pharmacist and uh, she runs our uh, pharmacology teaching, um, but not just that, she is very much involved in interprofessional interdisciplinary teaching. She hasn't been at the medical school very long, but since she's been at the medical school, Carly has adopted a student-centered approach in the provision of pharmacological education, a knowledge basis that is vital for safe medical students and interns to wield. Carly's restructuring, of the pharmacology curriculum has, has not only helped students prioritize the knowledge that they need in their future careers, but has also genuinely made students interested in learning pharmacology. Her delivery of teaching has been adaptive, adaptive to student preferences. Though she only needs to offer us education, Carly has also created uh, uh, care for us holistically as a cohort, and we want that to be recognized. And I think is particularly telling that although Carly was nominated by one student, um, there were 54 supporters of this nomination. And I think that is a very well-deserved um, award and congratulations, Carly. So that brings us to the end of this online faculty meeting and um, uh, brings me to, to the end uh, and, and thanking you. And there are so many people to thank. But I'd particularly um, like to thank my colleagues, the associate and sub-deans um, of uh, this medical school, uh, the student, student year coordinators who have supported the students through this very, very stressful and worrisome period, um, professional staff teams, um, the committee members of all the committees that we have uh, that continue to meet um, and make this school run uh, throughout the year. The students, particularly the present, the academic reps, the wellness reps and other reps. I've uh, already thanked Imogen as uh, my um, uh, director up until March and for all her support. But since uh, stepping into the role, um, sorry, until stepping into the role, I would have also thanked Julia, so I'll continue to do that. Julia, you've been outstanding supporting me as a deputy until um, 
March and continuing um, your support for the medical education part of my role. Uh, but since stepping into the role as the, the director, there are two people that I'd like to mention. The first is um, Katrina Chappell, the manager. Katrina has uh, done wonderful work in not just teaching me how to read a budget, how to prepare a budget, but also guided me through the kind of difficulties of um, thinking about strategy and how it involves budget. Um, and she's been very, very patient in explaining those rules for me. So thank you so much, Katrina. I look forward with uh, working with you for next year. And last, not least, um, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be on time. I wouldn't do, be able to do any of the jobs um, that I've been doing um, without having Cheryl as my executive assistant. Um, Cheryl uh, is not just managing my life, but she's also keeping me honest. She's reminding me of things. She's putting things on top of my email list that I keep forgetting. And she's been an absolutely wonderful person um, to work with. And I'd like to thank her for her support. Um, I don't think I could have done many of the jobs that I had to do um, this year without her. So that brings us to the end of uh, the faculty meeting. Uh, I don't have anything else to report. I'd be happy to take any questions if you have any. If you don't have any, then I would just like to um, thank you for attending. Um, I hope that uh, you will have some, maybe some time off or uh, can otherwise um, just recharge the battery. It's been a very difficult year. It's been a very challenging year. I think we've shown that as a team, um, we are a great team and that this is a great medical school and uh, that we've done a wonderful job throughout the pandemic, but it has been exhausting and it has been straining and I hope that you will all have some time off and that you can take some rest because guess what? We get to do it all again next year. I wish you a happy new year and a Merry Christmas if I don't see you and otherwise I shall see you again next year. Thank you so much for attending. Bye-bye.